Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. This is my second time, uh, a true pleasure to come before you, the, the LA County uh, Commission. And I'm really happy to be here to be presenting on a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, it's really also great to see a lot of people out here in the audience. I think um, the bigger or the larger number of people we can really talk to about this issue, um, the better off we're going to be. So just to give you an introduction uh, to who I am, if you don't know, my name is Ayako Miyashita. I work with the Williams Institute, which is located at the UCLA School of Law. The Williams Institute is a research institute that focuses on issues and concerns affecting LGBT populations. My role there at the Williams Institute is focused solely on HIV law and policy. Uh, my background is, is I am an attorney. I was practicing in HIV legal services for a number of years before coming to the Institute. And now um, I get to do this, this work on a daily basis um, from uh, a little bit uh, higher point of view, if you will. So um, I miss working with clients, uh, but this work also keeps me in touch with the community that I really care deeply about. So thank you for having me. Today's talk, we're going to focus on HIV criminalization. I'd just like to see a hands that number of people that have heard this term before. Great. So I'm working with a very, very educated group here, um, which is really nice because I think um, one of the things, one of the fears that we have about this topic is that uh, folks do not know what this means, what this term means and what we're talking about when we when we say HIV criminalization. So um, excuse me if, if a little bit of it is a con elementary for you. Um, I just want to make sure that we reach everybody here today. So we're going to start with some basics. Um, today's talk is going to be looking at identifying what is HIV criminalization and how are people living with HIV targeted for criminal prosecution in California? So the focus is California. You should know that HIV criminalization, though, is an issue that impacts people nationally and internationally. And there's been a lot of studies um, recently that have come out, um, both on those scales. After I cover those two bullet points, we're going to move to a discussion with the three panelists um, that when introduced. And in that discussion, we're going to talk about what can we do about it. So what are the next steps? What are the action items? So as a research institute, that's not our job. Um, but we do often um, work with and uh, provide research support and legislative support for those folks that are looking to address the issue in other ways. So what is HIV criminalization? Here are some ways to define HIV criminalization. It's the use of HIV specific and general criminal laws to specifically target people living with HIV. Oftentimes, the prosecution of people living with HIV based on these either HIV specific laws or general criminal laws are based on outdated and erroneous beliefs or understandings about, about HIV. What does this look like? Essentially, there are laws on the books, and I'll talk about how many and where, but there are laws on the books that criminalize at sometimes perceived exposure to HIV. Does that mean that there is actual exposure to HIV? In many cases, no. So these laws are, are on the books for a number of reasons. Some people give a narrative that they're as a result of Ryan White Care funding and a requirement that was placed by the federal government on states to implement a law within each state that would criminalize exposure. But if you look at the history, that doesn't necessarily explain all the laws on the books. So when we look at, for example, um, different states that have laws that are uh, quite extreme, I'll give Michigan as an example. There doesn't actually need to be any actual exposure to HIV under the Michigan statute. And the way that that statute is used is often, is often uh, I like to say quite interesting, uh, I think it's problematic. But um, what those statutes really show us is that they're based on a lot of stigma. And they're based on a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about how HIV is actually transmitted. So again, the prosecution of people living with HIV under these specific 
statutes and or the journal criminal statutes are often based on outdated science. They're used in addition to public health laws. So there are public health laws that, that help um, folks that are trying to connect with people that are living with HIV, that are newly diagnosed, that may not be informed about how best to care for themselves. Those laws can be quite strict and they can be quite powerful. But these laws are an additional layer. They're an additional layer because they add a criminal penalty. As I said before, most laws do not ex require exposure to HIV. And all of them, in fact, don't require transmission of HIV. And finally, most of these laws provide harsher penalties for people living with HIV. It means that if if the same crime, if you will, was committed by somebody with another infectious or communicable disease, that the penalty for that would be a lot less than what it is for people living with HIV. So in California, and we'll cover this a little bit later, uh, infectious and communicable diseases, uh, the exposure statute for that in California, the penalty is a misdemeanor. But for HIV, the HIV specific statute, the penalty is a felony. And we'll see that in a couple places throughout California law. So what does HIV criminalization look like in the United States? Uh, there's an interesting article. It was published um, just recently, but as a result of kind of work that the Depar Department of Justice and the Civil Rights Division has done to kind of look at this issue uh, nationally. And so here are some stats. So as of 2011, 67 HIV criminalization laws were on the books, identified in 33 states. Out of these, 25 out of 33, so 75% criminalize one or more behaviors that pose a low or negligible risk of HIV transmission. As those of you that are in the field may know, um, oral sex, for example, is something that's considered by the CDC to be low or negligible uh, risk of transmission. Nearly two-thirds criminalize potential HIV exposure. So again, there doesn't actually have to be exposure. And many of the laws were passed before our current understanding about the science. So um, something that we might take for granted now is that we understand that individuals that are, um, that are adherent to ARTs, antiretroviral uh, therapy, significantly reduce the risk of, of transmitting HIV. And so there, the, these laws, because they were, they were put on the books before those uh, scientific advancements, don't reflect what we know and what we understand, including that piece. There are concerns with HIV criminalization, and these I'm, I'm raising in a very general way. I think it would be useful if, if individuals that have questions or concerns about this can raise them um, in the Q&A afterwards. But I wanna raise them in a very general way just so that we can all be on the same page about why this issue is something that matters. So we like to contend that HIV criminalization by singling out HIV continues to contribute to HIV related stigma. Whether these laws are used, whether these laws are um, actively used, I should say, in a given state, it, it doesn't really matter in the context of this conversation because what we're talking about is the fact that they exist, that the language is already there, that they're on, again, the books. HIV criminalization negatively impacts LGBT populations. This argument stems from the fact that we know the epidemic has had a particularly significant impact uh, on men who have sex with men. Most of the laws do not follow general criminal law principles of requiring intent to harm. So um, in, in the law, there are a lot of different ways of, of building a criminal law. There are different intent requirements, and some laws require no intent, meaning you didn't have to mean to do harm to be penalized. Now, I should say for those of you that are familiar with California's law, we do actually have a specific intent requirement in the current HIV specific felony exposure statute, which is a, a good thing. But like I say in a lot of our conversations, uh, it's a good thing about a bad law. So take it in context. 
So a lot of the statutes um, in other territories and other jurisdictions don't require intent. They often result in disproportionate penalties. As I said, the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony is very big. In terms of the number of years, uh, just to give you an example, under the felony exposure statute, the possible penalty it could be greater than the penalty for an involuntary manslaughter. So think somebody could uh, actually die uh, as a result of somebody's actions, and that person will be penalized for fewer years than a person that's prosecuted under the felony exposure statute. And that doesn't require transmission, right? So the impact, the penalty is very harsh. We often say that these criminal statutes defeat public health messages about HIV. What does that mean? I think that those of you that have worked in this field have, have often relied on the public health messages that we, we use in talking about HIV. And one of them is that is one of mutual responsibility, that every individual should be responsible for their own health and to do their best at managing risk. And granted that it's not a level playing field and it's not, uh, it's not always easy to do or even possible to do, particularly for vulnerable populations, that that is a general message that we often use in, in the public health realm about HIV and about HIV transmission. But in this case, when you put a criminal penalty on the person living with HIV, you're targeting that person as, if you will, the bad actor. And so that really kind of goes to the heart of what, what is the public health message that we've been using for quite, a, quite some time now, which is of mutual responsibility. Finally, these criminal laws are not supported by research. So the research, if you take a look at it, there, there are a number of studies that I think have been central and key here. And I think uh, the challenge with the research is, is that it's, it, they can't prove a nullity, right? So um, the big question that often comes up is, do these criminal laws show to have a positive impact in the public health realm? Meaning, do these criminal laws influence kind of transmission rates in a given community? And that has yet to be proven. So how are people living with HIV targeted for criminal prosecution in California? I'm just gonna do a quick review of California law and provide you with a little bit of data so you can understand how it plays out here in California. So under general criminal statutes, doing kind of a traditional uh, legal research uh, methodology, so going in and trying to look for published cases on this issue, we see that the earliest criminal case addressing unprotected sexual activity, again, consensual sexual activity, involving a person living with HIV, was in 1998. And the way that that was played out in 1998, was, 1988, excuse me, was a charge for attempted murder. In those cases, HIV is considered the deadly weapon. From that point forward, you see a number uh, of prosecutions, not too many, but a number of prosecutions. And uh, I have to add that a published case it, it doesn't necessarily represent all the cases, right? So not all cases get published. There are a lot of cases that uh, never get published. There are a lot of cases that settle. There are a lot of cases in which we, won't, we can't even tell from looking at DOJ data that, to know exactly how these things played out. But the published cases give us a little bit of insight. So to the extent that they do, we talk about them, right? So um, the general criminal statutes were, used, were in use until 1991. And again, they were most often um, utilizing Penal Code Section 245, so assault with a deadly weapon. So what changed after 1991, what changed? In California, uh, we moved forward with an HIV-specific exposure statute in 1998. Prior to that, however, in 1988, we had put on the books a felony solicitation statute. I'll talk a little bit about that. Before I do, I just want to address this next code section is 1621.5. It is criminal penalties for the knowing donation of blood, body, organs, tissue, semen, or breast milk by a person living with HIV, essentially. 
in 1998, this was put on the books. Now, there are, are laws that prohibit people living with HIV from donating blood, but this is the, taking that extra step and criminalizing that behavior. So this was placed in the books in 1998, 1988. Uh, felony, it's a felony punishable by imprisonment, two, four, or six years. We weren't able to find a published case on it. We'll, we're, look, we're digging deeper to try to get some data to see if anyone has ever been punished under this statute. But again, like I said, there are rules already against donation of blood, right? There are practices in place, but this is that additional layer of a criminal penalty. The next code section I'm gonna talk about really quickly is the misdemeanor statute for other, and this is the language of the, of the statute, so pardon me, if, if you find it offensive, it's the law. Contagious, infectious, or communicable disease, so it's willful exposure. This is not specific intent, but it's knowing exposure from one person to another. And this statute, again, the misdemeanor statute, has been on the books for quite a long time, since 1939, and there are no published criminal cases on it. Often it's cited in civil proceedings where people are trying to sue others for, um, under tort for exposure or transmission of other uh, STIs. But this is the misdemeanor statute that we have on the books for all contagious, infectious, or communicable disease. So, so um, theoretically speaking, it's for all the other diseases that you can think of, the other STIs, other than HIV. And so now we get to Health and Safety Code 12291. That's the HIV-specific statute. So this is the law as it stands right now in California. If you engage in unprotected sexual activity and your person that knows you are infected with HIV, you don't disclose your status, and you have specific intent to infect the other person, you will be punished you will be uh, punished, and the, and the punishment will be a felony, and the term will be three, five, or eight years. What we know anecdotally is since this has been enacted since 1998, there are two individuals, um, not sure how many of you have seen uh, a couple of the studies that have come out where, where actually there was a, a journalist, Sergio Hernandez, I believe his name was, that that tried to get this data across the entire country. And uh, this particular individual was able to get information from the uh, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations. And in his figures, he was able to identify two individuals that um, were either incarcerated and are now on parole based on this statute. So this is the HIV exposure felony statute. The next statute is Penal Code 647F. This is the statute I re referred to earlier called the uh, felony solicitation statute. So for any person that is charged with solicitation, um, and just so if you don't know what's, what solicitation entails, solicitation is kind of the fancy word <laughs> I say fancy because it's actually prostitution plus, so it's, um, and again, that word itself is also problematic, so I'm gonna call it sex work, but sex work plus. So it's anybody that's suspected of even engaging in sex work, right? So starting to have a conversation uh, about a possible negotiation. For some communities, particularly, um, I've, I've spoken with uh, uh, members of the transgender community, um, Latina transgender community, and we've seen reports of this as well, where folks are walking down the street and perceived to be somewhat engaging in some type of behavior that could be perceived as solicitation. So solicitation is a really broad term, but if anyone gets charged with it, this is what happens. Uh, the person is automatically tested for HIV, and those test results are transmitted back to the court. And if that same person ever gets picked up on a solicitation charge again, the punishment is no longer a misdemeanor, it's a felony. And so that we call that the felony solicitation statute. And I don't have, I'm sorry, the penalty listed here. Um, I believe it's up to eight years. I have to go back and look. Let me see if I can get my research team over here to look it up. In 647F. 
Thank you. Um, so this sentence enhancement for, for anybody that was previously convicted of solicitation comes out having a uh, HIV positive diagnosis, um, will, will be punished with a felony. It means longer, um, longer confinement. Anecdotally speaking, we know that in California, that community, those individuals that are being punished under the felony solicitation statute are the majority of the folks that are being criminalized for HIV right now. So it's a particularly salient issue for people living with HIV and for people engaging in sex work. The last statute is an uh, uh, HIV specific statute that calls for a sentence enhancement for certain specific sex offenses. So this sentence enhancement applies to anybody who is living with HIV that is convicted of the enumerated offenses listed. Also enacted in 1988 along with the felony solicitation statute, this is actually one of the sentence enhancements that has uh, been utilized the most in terms of looking at the published cases. And it's a three-year enhancement. So in all of these statutes that I've just reviewed for you, exposure is not necessarily required. Transmission is definitely not required. And the punishment, as I said, is significant and severe in comparison to the way other STIs are treated. And so that is really the reason why a lot of, a lot of folks across the country have been looking at this issue and have been asking, what is it that we need to do? What is it that we can do? What is it that we should do to modernize these laws and to bring them into a place where we can take into account updated knowledge, updated science, we can take into account what are best practices. We can look at the cases that are already kind of been prosecuted. And we can come to a better understanding of this issue and a more mediated position. So what can we do about it? Um, for this portion, I've invited uh, three colleagues of mine to join the conversation. And I want to go ahead and ask a couple of questions of each panelist before we open it up for Q&A, because I think each, uh, each of these gentlemen over here really have something to offer in terms of giving us an idea of what, is, what are the next steps, what can be done about it, OK? So Aaron, I just want to start with uh, a couple questions for you. So what does it mean for California to modernize these laws? And how can California be a leader in addressing HIV criminalization? And what are some key strategies that, strategies that you think could start, start that conversation? Uh, so um, thanks for that overview. And I think that um, I know when, <clears throat> when this conversation started, um, which um, Craig and, and Marco will get to about the, the, the group um, of, of stakeholders that have been uh, put together uh, to look at, at really making a difference uh, in these laws uh, here in California. Um, we're really, at this point, following some of the things that the federal government um, has already um, endorsed. Uh, the Department of Justice has released statements um, around um, uh, states decriminalizing um, HIV laws in 2014. Um, there was also um, introduced uh, by one of our um, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, which was called the Repeal Act, um, which would provide states incentives for modernizing their um, HIV criminalization laws. And then finally, there was the HOPE Act, um, which was also introduced um, in Congress, which would allow um, organ transplants. So it's essentially um, you know, policy equity around organ transplants uh, for someone who is HIV positive and um, is then deceased and wants to uh, contribute their organs to someone who is also HIV positive. Currently, that can't happen. So that's been introduced in Congress as well. Um, but 
uh, on the state level, um, there have been um, some efforts um, in Iowa, in Washington, and in Michigan, um, but there has never been um, a comprehensive effort to really look at um, all of the laws on the books, so not just the felony, um, for instance, in California, the felony transmission or expo well, exposure law, um, but to really look at all of these laws um, and see how all of these laws contribute to stigma um, and also are a social driver for people not getting tested out of fear um, because these laws exist. Uh, and um, I think California is sort of uniquely placed uh, being that you know the governor just gave his inaugural his fourth inaugural um, address um, and said that he was proud that California had the most progressive some of the most progressive laws in the nation and wants us to continue in that tradition um, I think that that fits in with that idea um, is that um, California having one of the largest epidemics in the country and having a really huge base um, of people who are committed to making sure that uh, people are not unjustly punished um, or stigmatized um, due to their HIV status. And the fact that we have usually um, a, a very receptive legislature um, and sometimes a receptive governor. Uh, I think that, that we're uniquely position to make a statement um, by moving forward with a really comprehensive approach and looking at all of these code sections um, that um, this could really affect what other states do um, if we're successful in this effort and we move forward with it. Um, and so as far as some of the strategies go um, for doing this, um, one I think first is, is education. Um, a lot of these laws were, as you can see, were passed um, many years ago, um, and it's sort of not a topic that we were always discussing, um, like some other topics, um, but I think it, it, it is really significant. And so there needs to be some education done, not only um, to communities that may not always be thinking uh, about HIV and people who are at risk for HIV, but within our own community as well. Um, and advocacy obviously is something that we constantly do on a regular basis uh, and um, will continue to do. Uh, and then um, legislation. Obviously we're dealing with, with law here. Uh, and if we want, <clears throat> excuse me, if we want to make a change to that, then we're going to have to change the law. And that's going to require state legislation. Uh, and also, media and communications and research are really important to help people really understand this issue. Um, I think that there's, uh, um, you know, a, a, there's a uh, a focus that has been, especially within the last five years in California, about really trying to hold together what we have budget-wise and try to hold together what we have service-wise, um, and so. A lot of the other issues that really affect people in our community have unfortunately been put on the back burner, and I think this is one of those issues. Um, and I think this is sort of the right time, uh, especially here in California, um, for us to address the issue. Uh, and I think that this issue is related to other social justice issues around criminalization um, of behavior, uh, and of choices people make in their life um, that should not be criminalized. Uh, so I think that in sort of a general philosophy around um, what some, you know, what should be a criminal act in our society and what shouldn't, I think that sort of goes to the heart of that argument. Um, so I think California can make a really big difference um, across the nation, um, not only by pursuing this, um, but also by succeeding and in changing these really archaic and horrible laws that are still on the books. Aaron, I want to ask a quick follow-up question on that, and um, certainly other folks that are interested in responding to it. I think one of the tensions that we often hear about and talk about when we, when we look at this issue is, you know, what if you have somebody that's really bad, okay, somebody, uh, this, this comes up a lot, that really does want to harm other people, um, 
Does, does any kind of change to this law make it so that we can't criminalize such bad behavior? I mean, I would think in the conversations that, that you know, we have all had and the conversations I've had with stakeholders is, is that it's extremely important for us to maintain uh, protections for when those situations do happen. And obviously, those situations are few and far between. Um, but there needs to be laws on the books to address those situations, especially in cases of sexual violence, um, especially in cases um, where we know that there's a power dynamic um, and sexual assault um, or violence might be used. Um, I, at sort of the core of, of one of you know, our principles is making sure um, that we have laws on the books that still continue to address those situations. Thank you. Craig, I'm going to move on to you. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, what have been advocates been doing to engage on this issue? What's the legislative strategy uh, for modernizing these criminal laws that target people living with HIV? And what are some guiding principles that um, are helping you and your efforts and group's efforts to, to doing this work? Yeah, thank you. Um, so these conversations obviously have been going on for quite some time. I mean, IOC and the Williams Institute have been doing this research for a while and helping gather the data. But the most recent conversations really started last year after the HIV is Not a Crime Conference, which took place in Iowa. I believe that was put on by Sarah Project. And so after that conference, advocates here in California really began meeting to look at the statutes here in California and figure out what would be the best strategy to pursue to make modifications, if at all. And so at least over the last few months, groups have been meeting in Southern California and Northern California to really look at these statutes and look at model legislation and see if we do decide to pursue a bill, what changes exactly would we propose? So those conversations are happening now. We formed a statewide work group. We had our first statewide conference call yesterday. So if you would like to be involved in those conversations, please talk to us because we're more than happy to you know, have as many people involved as possible. As far as the legislative strategy we're pursuing, I think IACO did a really good job of, you know, giving an overview of these statutes and how we're looking at changing them. So especially removing the statutes that specifically target people with HIV. So the blood donation and organ donation statute, the solicitation while positive statute. And then also, like Aaron said, making sure that we continue to criminalize bad actors. So if there are individuals who are intentionally trying to infect someone, that that behavior is still criminalized. Um, in terms of guiding principles, I think something that we've discussed and has been really important in this work is making sure that we don't leave especially vulnerable communities behind. So for example, 647F, the solicitation while positive, you know, it specifically targets sex workers. So any comprehensive modernization bill that we want to propose, we want to make sure we don't leave behind those vulnerable groups. And especially since that statute specifically is used more than the others, we want to make sure that that's included in any legislation that we propose. Great. One of the things I think that um, in making any kind of legislative change, follow-up question, Craig, is, is the fear that you're going to make the situation worse. So in California, we have a, an exposure statute, the felony exposure statute, that does require specific intent. So as I said, as I alluded to earlier, it's a, it's a good, bad law, if you will. Um, what are some of the kind of the principles that you're holding on to that will ensure that that, um, that you're not going to end up worse off than you started? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think one definitely is making sure the punishment is proportionate to the harm. So like you mentioned, the current felony statute makes exposure to HIV or intent to infect HIV similar to voluntary manslaughter, and so, or a felony similar to voluntary manslaughter. So making sure that the punishment is proportionate to any harm that's being done and also making sure that intent is actually required. So like you said, the law that we have now is really good and has the intent requirement. So making sure that any law going forward also has that requirement. Okay, great. So I wanna move, to, move on to Marco. Thank you, Craig. Um, 
Marco, how do we bring light to this issue? How do we educate the public? How do we, why do we think it's important? Why are we, why are we even doing this? And um, can you explain a little bit about what, what you're doing to uh, get more people involved in this conversation? Sure. Buenos dias. Um, it's, it's great to be here, and, and I'm so happy that we're able to come and, and make this case with enough time for us to discuss with all of you. It's uh, extremely important for us to um, continue fighting any laws that criminalize people, um, specifically because of their HIV status. As a, an HIV positive person, or as a person living with HIV, uh, th there is so much things that you go through on your everyday life, um, at work, at home, with your family, and on top of that, um, you are also criminalized in a draconian way um, all over the country. There is um, over 34 states that criminalize people, or a little bit more. Um, and so it is important for us, not only people living with HIV, but also our allies, our families, our communities, to raise and to um, build, um, the important thing is to build a very strong um, public case for, for, for this issue. There is so much misinformation out there, not only about HIV, but um, about HIV loss. And so it's really, really important that we build strong coalitions, we educate the public, not only the people that are members of our community, but the public in general, that we uh, talk to the media. I think that you may have seen any reports around HIV criminalization by the media, and they are completely one-sided. Um, I've talked to families of people that, have, that are in jail in California right now. I have friends of mine who have been criminalized um, in different states, um, and they've told me the experiences that they've gone through um, in the prisons. And so I think that it's really, really important for us if we want to change the laws, that we build a very strong case, um, that we come together. Um, one of the things that we've been doing since we start um, meeting and um, working with the in the legislative piece is that we're also um, are going to build a public engagement um, coalition and group of people. So uh, as Craig said, um, if you want to be involved in this process um, that is moving quite fast, um, please uh, follow up with us. I will be here after and we'll leave some business cards too for you to follow up with us. Um, so, so I think that, that what, what we're trying to do is bring together a group of people that really represent the people that are infected by HIV and the people that are affected in also um, in a not, not direct way. M again, members of our families, our, our communities, and people that can really put a face, a human face, into this issue. Thank you, Marco. I think. You raise an issue that I think all of us have been very concerned about, which is kind of the intersectionality of HIV, that we can no longer work in a silo atmosphere, that we can't just look look within our own groups and, and the people that we know, that we have to look outside of that and understand this as a broader social justice issue. And so to the extent that this group has been organizing, I just want to you know, give, give the people that are involved really some, some accolades for reaching out. Um, and trying to work with people that traditionally you haven't worked with before. Um, but that is a continuing project, and so um, to the extent that you'd like to contribute to that process and um, are interested in you know, kind of helping out, uh, these, are the, these are the folks to get in touch with. The issue of criminalization, I think, is, is controversial at times. Um, I think... Um, you know, today we're entering a room of, uh, with a lot of people here that already know about the issue, so I think probably a little bit less controversial. But I should say that when we're talking to people that are not in this room, talking to people that don't know about this issue, talking to people that haven't really thought about this issue, um, there are one of two responses. One is that um, I don't even know what that is, number one. And two, well, those people should be criminalized, right? So it's not until we really dig deep and look into the issue that we can really start to pull out what are the nuances and what are the things that are troubling about HIV criminalization. But I want to say that I think you know your 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 state, California, um, have has a lot of advocates that are willing to look at those hard questions and those concerns. 
So um, I want to go ahead and ask the co-chairs to open it up for a Q&A. And if you have one of those hard questions, please, please don't be afraid to ask. Um, these are concerns or considerations that the group needs to hear and the group needs to consider in moving forward. And those are not seen as challenges so much as efforts to make sure that any movement on HIV criminalization in California are reflective of the beliefs and understandings of the people here. So thank you. Okay. Questions? Please raise your hand. Monique. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. So, um, so I know that you're focused on criminalization, but I'm also wondering to what extent you're looking at civil issues. So for example, um, I think almost two years ago, we talked um, very briefly here about um, called California Civil Code Section 1710.2. Um, and that's, in, it's, uh, it's related to real estate where the agent doesn't have to disclose if somebody who had HIV died within three years of the purchase or the transfer of property. And um, I think it just got lost. Somebody was gonna explore and I think it got lost on the long to-do list of the commission. And so um, I don't even know what that really means if it's something that is actually enforced. It doesn't seem like a criminal issue, but I guess my real question is to what extent do you, or is there another group that looks at uh, civil issues as, as opposed to criminal issues? Thank you, Monique. I think um, I can respond to that. So uh, as part of the kind of HIV criminalization research, I don't think that would fall within the wheelhouse, but anything related to HIV is certainly something that we do look at. So we can connect offline. I'd be happy to take a look at that statute for you and we can noodle around to see what's going on with that. I think any time that you have anything that's targeted specifically to people living with HIV, we, we should question that. We should look at that. Um, so as part of my other duties, if you will, um, I'm happy to work with you and with anyone that has questions like that. For civil issues, I think um, there are civil remedies, right? So oftentimes, um, those types of issues, if they, if they do come into question or controversy, they rise to the occasion of a, of a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit. And there are individuals, organizations, I should say, that um, are there to address those from kind of a disability rights perspective, from a uh, civil rights perspective, from a discrimination perspective. So if there are specific instances where those issues come up, there, there are also um, resources for those, for those folks. Thank you. Abad. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting and informative. Uh, I was uh, in San Diego for the USCA conference, and I was attending a session um, talking about the uh, HIV and criminalization too. And I hear there that uh, the governor from Iowa has signed the, the law uh, ban that that law uh, that law is not more in Iowa. Um, the criminalization against people with HIV. So what are we doing here in, in, in California? And also, um, I remember a case, um, but I don't remember which state, where a person with uh, HIV spied to an a officer. And I'm not sure if uh, that person still is in, in, in the jail, but I think that is very... Um, stupid that the prosecutors don't, don't be informed about it because you, everybody knows that, um, well, we know that uh, saliva is not a, a fluid that could transmit the HIV, so uh, I wonder uh, what, um, what the, the lawyers or the people that are, are uh, fighting against this, this, uh, this crimin criminalization thinks about that because I think that it's an archaic law and that they think that uh, saliva could transmit the HIV. So it's, it's kind of weird that. So I wonder what do you think about it? Thank you. So I can address the piece about Iowa and the spitting and biting, and then I'm going to pass it off to our panelists to answer about the what are we doing in California. So in Iowa, the law did change. It was a significant change for Iowa in that Iowa's law um, required sex offender registry as a result of being convicted of their exposure statute. 
Um, sex offender registry is very harsh impact on people. And um, in fact, one of the real highlights of the Grinnell gathering um, last year was after the law was put into place and uh, two individuals that were uh, on the sex offender registry that had anklet bracelets um, had them cut off because of the change of the law. As a result, we could remove them. Um, really emotional moment, but it was an incredible moment that those uh, individuals were no longer uh, considered sex offenders and were no longer monitored as sex offenders. So in Iowa, that was a really big change. Um, one of the other changes in Iowa that I think have, has met some kind of conflicted response is that uh, the new statute uh, did incorporate other diseases, particularly hepatitis. Um, there was a feeling from a national perspective that, you know, increasing penalties or creating new penalties is not something that we want to do. And so to the extent that it expanded penalties and um, to other infectious and communicable diseases, from a national perspective, that was seen as, as, as a not uh, not so positive move. Um, so there's been a little bit of a mixed response with regard to Iowa, but um, I just want to say that for the advocates that really push for that change, reducing the punishments um, that were previously meted out for individuals prosecuted under that statute, it was an incredible victory. In terms of spitting and biting, there's been a long-term uh, campaign to provide education to law enforcement in different jurisdictions. Uh, there's a resource document called Spit Does Not Transmit, and it specifically targets law enforcement communities. And I think that here's an example of where the work just doesn't end with a law change, right? So even if you change the law in a particular state, in a particular jurisdiction, you still have practices and policies in place that are problematic. And so the spit does not transmit kind of campaign really highlights that there's a need for continuing education. And I think that it's an area of great need. Uh, law enforcement, um, there's still issues that come up on a regular basis where there's improper disclosure, um, there's uh, improper treatment of people living with HIV that come into contact with the criminal justice system and so that's just one of the issues and I think that um, that needs to continue to be worked on in terms of what we are doing um, any any one of you could answer that question so I think just from a sort of really base uh, what are we doing we're gonna work to change the laws um, that's what we're doing at this point is to rewrite the laws um, so that they uh, are modern, they reflect the advances in science, and that they are fair and just. Um, and we, once um, we have, once a, a bill um, is going to, will, once it's introduced, which I anticipate it will be um, within, probably within the month, um, and we have language, um, that language will go to, as far as the commission goes, that language will go to public policy um, for consideration and then we'll come to the full commission um, for support um, or not support. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna change the law. And, and starting right now, uh, we're also working at crafting um, education, ed educational tools for all of us to use. And, and, um, and I think that we're at a very important moment um, to address so many uh, changes or advancements in science um, that it's important for us to take, um, uh, to, to, to really take um, um, or size the moment and really start talking at home with your friends, at school, at work. Um, and we're going to create um, tools for all of us to engage in those conversations, to really took that, take down those barriers that exist right now around the misinformation on HIV and furthermore HIV criminalization. I do want to say that after the removal of the bracelet in Iowa, we did celebrate it with tequila. <laughs> Next up, I have Susan. Hi. Uh, is that working? MP. So um, I don't want to go into the whole thing against the position of the Vermont or the Eastern or what they have on that. Can you so speak up, please? I guess not. Oh, there. OK, sorry. Um, so I think that um, my question has to do with sort of um, you know, with, with um, substance abuse or substance misuse, 
um, the, the sort of um, criminality of it is switched from sort of like this is a moral failing for which you should be punished to this is a medical issue for which you should get mandatory treatment, right, or, you know, get help. Um, and the opposite trajectory seems to happen with HIV, right? We, we think of HIV as a medical issue, but um, it was seen, like, especially when these original laws were drafted, as a criminal issue, right? So it's just, that's just interesting to me, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. And then the other thing I want to talk about, at the risk of sounding paranoid, is, you know, as you're, as you're and I'm not exactly sure what you mean by changing the laws, but, you know, the more the state has a right to scrutinize your body and your life, you know, what's gonna happen to people who know their HIV status and are not med compliant and they have a viral load above a certain point? Are they then criminalized? I mean, the state, I, do, I realize this I'm paranoid, so I'm gonna stop there, but um, <laughs> that's, that's my general question. Um, I'll just speak to the second point as far as, I mean, the medical aspect of it and bringing that into the law. And so, I mean, one of the main points that we're looking at in modernizing these statutes is making sure it's in line with science and medicine today. And so, as far as modifying the existing misdemeanor statute, we're also looking at incorporating uh, various provisions to make sure that it's in line with modern science. So, for example, I just have my list here of what's required. So, not only is the person required to have knowledge of their infection, and intent to transmit, but they also have to engage in contact the conduct that poses a substantial risk of transmission and not take means to prevent transmission. So there is language that actually incorporates the conduct that you're engaging in and whether or not you're actually taking means to prevent transmission. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And then, first. So I think the, <clears throat> the first one was, was more of a comment, which I completely agree with, um, and uh, I think that uh, you know this this whole issue um, around um, the state having a right uh, to regulate uh, sort of what we do with our bodies and what they decide what they can do with our bodies um, is something that we constantly grapple with, um, and I think it that. That that's tied up in this issue as well around around government overreach and around privacy and around constitutional rights about whether or not uh, you know the state has a right to uh, you know stick a swab in your mouth or a needle in your arm uh, and so um, you know one of the things that we would be proposing um, in um, any legislation we'd be putting forward, for instance, um, is to eliminate mandatory testing um, when there is um, uh, either uh, arrest um, or charge for solicitation. Um, there can be an offer of a test, but someone has to have the right to decline it. Um, and that's not currently the case. Uh, and so um, that is definitely one of the core principles um, of the legislation that we would envision um, is that if anything, we would be trying to roll back um, that overreach that exists. And primarily that overreach exists because, you know, when the law was passed um, in, in the 80s, there was this feeling that, oh, if we, if we just stop people from doing sex work, that's gonna make this huge dent in the HIV epidemic, which we know is totally false and was not supported by science. Um, and um, actually, there was you know, new research that was just uh, unveiled uh, at the International AIDS Conference that demonstrated decriminalizing sex work um, actually ends up reducing new HIV transmissions rather than um, increasing them. So um, I think if anything, at least from the center's perspective, I don't want to speak on anyone else's behalf, we would be in favor of moving more towards that position than any other position. I just want to add, you know, the, the true backstop to that circumstance you described where someone who's not med compliant, who has a high viral load, um, who might fall under this statute, I think is, is the specific intent requirement. That's one thing that's just a non-negotiable. You have to truly intend to infect the other person. And so I think um, that that piece is, is what needs to be preserved and will continue to be preserved in any kind of uh, situation of modernization. And, and there also has to be transmission. And there also has to be transmission. So 
you know, in any kind of criminal statute, um, and Ayako's the lawyer, so I, I hope I get this right, um, you know, there has to be harm that results, right? So if there's no harm that results, and there really shouldn't be any kind um, of prosecution, at least in my opinion. So if there's no transmission, I don't know, you're really dealing with a mental health issue rather than a criminal issue. And to your, to your kind of comment and your first point about harm reduction, I think we are looking to the harm reduction world to, to kind of help us with this process. We have allies that work um, in that world. And, and the reason being is that I think uh, most often you'll see even in the law, in the language of the law, that uh, substance abuse and, and prostitution are always pulled together. Um, in fact, we had an advocate um, that works with sex workers point that out to us yesterday, that there's language in the law that says, you know, prevention education programs to substance abusers or prostitutes. So that's literally the language of the law. And so to the extent that we see that there's movement in the harm reduction world, movement um, among folks that work with um, individuals that, um, that, that use substances, that we want to see that same movement happen for those that are um, engaged in sex work or perceived to be engaged in sex work. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. So I was wondering if we could make a law that has language that all this law information be put in with health um, classes in school so that people can see the, um, the criminalization of HIV and also gain HIV information as well. Because Ayako, you mentioned before that there's these two um, sort of polar opposite reactions when somebody is in the media about, oh, they're HIV infected and they slept with so-and-so, whatever. And so the first group is like, oh my god, um, they deserve to go to jail. But the other reaction is, oh, well, we don't have enough information. Like, we don't know because we know, especially people here in the community. And so with that being said, it just feels like media really does have um, a burden as well as um, a responsibility to report possibly um, together what had happened along with, oh, well, we don't have all the information of HIV. So I was wondering for whomever, um, who and what entities um, should we pursue in that aspect so that all the information is out there so that the general public receives this information? So that's my first question. Second question is, I haven't heard anything about the three condoms rule or law recently. Any updates? Okay, so Aaron will handle the condoms as evidence question, and then um, I can respond to the first after that. So there was a, a law passed um, last year that was signed um, by the governor, um, which if, if everyone doesn't know, there, there's something sort of called the three condoms rule, where um, if you are um, searched by police on the street um, or in a car for whatever reason, and you could just be walking down the street and a lot of our clients call it, uh, you know, um, basically walking while trans um, in a certain neighborhood um, and get uh, harassed by the police. Um, and if you have more than three condoms on you, they immediately arrest you for um, solicitation or for at least sus suspect of solicitation. Um, and uh, we co-sponsored a bill last year that, that ended up being a two-year bill with AIDS Healthcare Foundation that was supported by a number of other organizations um, that would have tried to eliminate condoms as evidence completely um, in all cases. So they would, condoms would never be able to be used against someone. Obviously, we want people to carry more condoms if they have them, right, than less. Uh, and so, um, unfortunately, um, due to some pushback from um, the law enforcement community, um, that bill ended up sort of being watered down um, and changed uh, to where now there has to be um, a hearing um, before condoms can be introduced um, into evidence and used against someone in a prostitution or a loitering case. Um, and so there were some, um, I think, 
positive steps that were taken to address that. Um, but because of some procedural issues, we weren't able to get the full bill that we wanted passed. But it is going to be harder for prosecutors to use condoms as evidence against people in court. Um, the other, only other thing I would add on your first question um, is that I know that um, there's an LGBT group, um, and I won't mention their name because I don't know that how where they are on the issue yet and how far they've gone, but I know they are planning to um, at least introduce a bill this year in California that would update um, all of our sex ed um, laws to include LGBT specific and HIV specific information because they're really, really outdated um, and, and at this point poorly written. The only thing I was going to add to that, Michelle, is that um, I was at a, a White House meeting um, focused on HIV, and what you just raised as an issue was the point of conversation. And you know, convening a bunch of experts to talk about how this can be done um, nationally and then locally. I think people are grappling with that question a lot. I think generally speaking, uh, you know, we're all very uncomfortable talking about sex, um, me excluded. Um, it's part of my job, okay. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, folks are uncomfortable talking about sex, and so getting to a discussion about risk a lot of times is a really challenging thing. And, and so I think to the extent that the public engagement, the community engagement piece can really reflect some of those concerns and talking about getting to younger folks, how that can happen, how we can catch folks early in that conversation, I think is, is really central. The one thing, Michelle, that I also will add is um, along with doing education with the public in general, um, I think that it's very important for us to actually contact our representatives and let them know that this issue affects us or affects you. Um, I was talking to people in Iowa, and one of the biggest, the biggest, the bigger lessons, the bill went on and on and on from different committees for about two years. And when they asked the legislators why they didn't support um, the, legis the, the, the bill, um, they said that because their constituents have not reached out to them. And so I think that it's very important that we, um, and, and we are going to create tools for us to do that easily, um, and, but I think that it's important for us to start calling or talking or writing the people that um, are our representatives, our legislators, and, and, and that will also ring a bell to them. Thank you for uh, renewing this with uh, criminalization for um, HIV. One of the things that I was interested in that I found was through the University of Nebraska. As an HIV person, when I returned to work twice, my schedule was rearranged and I had less hours, got less pay, because people thought I was never going to show up for work. So therefore, it started this horrible uh, cycle of I never had money, I couldn't do this, and I couldn't work, but I can work. So one of the things that I've been working on is the criminalization for people to return to work, to get their exact schedule, their exact pay, everything that they're entitled to in spite of their HIV status. That's number one. Number two, um, I looked up some of the work that you guys have been doing. One of the things I was interested in was transgender um, identification for voting. I thought that was very interesting, and I think that's very needed. Um, when we speak to the issue of uh, stigma, that alone will help stigma issues. And lastly, um, for everyone who's listening who has HIV who or doesn't have HIV, anytime you're being discriminated because of your health, the ADA or the American Disability Act through the Justice Department has a 1-800 number. They will help you. I've worked, my best work is with them. So I urge you, if you are ever discouraged between work or accessibility through health, make sure you check in with them. They did a great job, where are you, Fariba? Um, they did a great job with dentistry, just to give you a short example. Someone kept scheduling their appointment in the morning who was HIV. They couldn't get in a morning, you know this, they couldn't get a morning uh, appointment. They could only get a late afternoon appointment because they wanted to make sure no one else used the chair or the instruments, instruments um, that were um, gonna be used. So, I urge you to call that number or speak to people who are legally um, advisable on these things so we can stop the stigma and this discrimination. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the transgender ID voting piece is very, very central. I think it was a really interesting piece that came out recently and had a, had a big impact. Um, with regard to your other comments, I just want to say I think 
just discrimination against people living with with HIV, generally speaking, is a problem, and it continues to be a problem, and it continues to be a problem despite all the advances that we've made. And so, I want to make a a special plug. The ADA is a great example of good of good law that helps. Um, uh, but without the attorneys, you can't really implement it as well as, as you can. You can rely on the government. Um, in the case of the ADA and the DOJ, uh, they'll take a complaint and they'll investigate it and they'll push it forward if they feel that they can make good strides with it, which is wonderful. Um, but um, I'd make a plug here, a shameless plug, uh, as a previous HIV legal services attorney, it's really uh, attorneys that are on the ground that do um, take on discrimination cases um, that can really help to, to push those um, kind of conflicts um, into uh, a more negative space, a space where there isn't a power, power dynamic between an employer and an employee. Um, so I would, um, I would make that plug. Thank you. I just wanted to make a couple of points. As uh, you proceed with going about changing the law or making it more modern, that is reflective of what is going on today, I urge you to do a couple of things. One is to look at the science really objectively, and uh, you know, be mindful of you know all the nuances that go along with you know what is the intent of this law. Um, a couple of statements were made this morning. One is about, you know, spit doesn't transmit or saliva. I, again, I urge you to look at the science really objectively because that statement is false. And there are a lot of nuances that go along with it. And there is pretty good robust scientific, um, you know, data that is out there that you could look at. And the second thing is that I think we need to continue being mindful of women who continue being at risk or getting infected because their partners don't disclose, or they are in a power dynamic in a relationship where they cannot possibly protect themselves. So I think we really need to keep all of those in mind as we go ahead with changing the law. Thank you. Those points are really well taken. And, um, and you're absolutely right that a lot of times in simplifying a message, we lose the nuance. Um, and we have to really be cautious about who our audience is and what we're trying to get to, but really be mindful of the fact that when we're saying something, we're leaving something else out. Um, the second piece about women, I, I, I would encourage one of you to respond to that because I think it's something that has been on the forefront of our mind from the get-go um, as an issue that concerns women, particularly um, heterosexual women that are infected or at risk. So um, this, is, this has definitely been one of the key issues um, that we've looked at and made sure that um, we're reaching out um, to um, victims' rights organizations um, and survivors um, to ensure that w the language that we come up with um, continues to protect people who are victims of um, sexual assault, sex crimes, um, and uh, intimate partner violence. Um, and so they, they've they been giving us feedback um, on some of the language that, that we're looking at, and that's been really, really helpful to us. So we've been really mindful in making sure that those groups are involved um, so that we fully understand all of the implications um, of changing the law, but changing it in a way um, that is not going to take away um, the rights of someone who has been um, assaulted. I wasn't referring to assault. I was talking about consensual relationship where partners don't disclose. That as well. We've been looking at that as well. I think um, recently there was a large co uh, national convening uh, by the Positive Women's Network. And uh, for those of you that know Walt Center Fit, he was there um, presenting. And, you know, this particular constituency is, is often known as having very mixed feelings about the HIV criminalization issue in these statutes. And so we've been really vetting kind of opinions and, and, and perspectives on this that are, are broad. Um, Positive Women's Network is actually one of the organizations that is part of the steering committee and part of the leadership of this effort. So that's one really um, great thing about um, what these folks are doing. So my name is Brad Land, hi. Um, and thank each of you for educating us and bringing us up to speed with the criminalization of HIV. Um, I have a lot of different thoughts and I've been participating in support groups, running support groups, 
um, for a long time, and I have wrestled with this with um, my peers living with HIV and AIDS um, over the years um, with regards to their unaware of their status, the criminalization of them, and I have realized that there's so much stigma and there's so much process that goes on from the point of infection and understanding somebody got infected as well and the realization of who they are as a human being and how their disease impacts them individually and collectively. So one of our challenges as a planning council is to find those that are unaware of their status. And, um, and, I, and, and these are just thoughts. I have no actual opinion yet on these. I, I still wrestle with these. I need more education and today was a big part of it and I need to digest that. Um, but one of the concerns I've had is I feel that the ACA um, has left out people living with HIV to some degree and I believe that is a criminalization in and of itself when it comes to specialty services. And, um, and I believe that possibly standardizing legislation as it goes forward and bringing standards forward and attaching it to legislation could be very helpful and very effective for inclusion of us in the ACA. Um, so, and, and so rolling back legislation needs to be very thoughtful and very deliberate and it needs to have some very comprehensive um, evaluation and not necessarily be watered down um, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to a certain degree where it's just impacting our ability to actually meet our federal charge and it, which is 100% access, zero disparity and we want to end AIDS. So I, I think there's another component that also needs to be included and I, and I think it's part of our educational process and it's something that we wrestle with as planners and how to do that and how to reach and challenge ourselves with health disparities and, um, and actually educate the community. And I, I think hopefully out of this process, our public policy committee, Aaron, might be able to produce a document, a fact sheet, um, for consumers as well as providers that are running support groups and things where the information is not so shoddy. And I think that's one of the largest problems too is we have a lot of information out there that's really shoddy. And um, when it comes to education, sometimes it's, it, it, it's just not clear. And you watch people wrestle with it in a support group, it's a whole nother ballpark. And, um, and maybe that's something we challenge our support groups throughout the county of Los Angeles and, and our consumers that are going through harm reduction counseling or just health education and even in our prevention arm, that we really just have some information out there and we need it on our website. Um, and so those are just my general comments and, and I don't know if you guys have feedback on any of them, but um, I really appreciate it today and thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone want to take any of those comments? I think Marco, if anything, you can, you know, he said it already and I'll just reiterate that, you know, getting information out, getting good information out, getting information that is, is in plain language and understandable, digestible by large audiences is, is going to be one of, one of um, his main tasks that, and his group's main tasks. And, it, and I also think that we're looking at um, really just talking to people. Um, I think that there is um, a lot to be said about um, finding stories, personal stories, like in those support groups that you're talking about, it would be great for us to actually engage um, in a grassroots um, approach to, to educating. And I, but I, and, and I also think that it's important for us to, um, to, to again consider um, looking at the different sectors that we're going to have to deal with and um, besides, as I said before, besides people that really understand and they may be aware of LGBT or HIV issues, we also need to tap into other, um, into other populations that can really help us. Um, and I think that, um, I also think that within the conversations that we're having as we plan this public engagement piece, we also have thought about not only civil rights, but 
that human rights. And I think that if we think of ourselves here in California as sort of like this little light or this little fire that hopefully one day would really like reach out to the folks that are not as privileged as us here. So as I go along with my vision or my process um, on how to do and reach out the, the hearts and minds of people, I'm also always keeping in mind my brothers and sisters that are in other countries, that are in other situations like women that you were talking about. And it's important for us to bring that into the mix as we do this work. I just want to add to that too. I mean, like I said in the beginning, it's a it's not just a national state level issue, it's an international issue. If you see the regulations that were proposed in Uganda most recently that had um, specific harsher penalties for people living with HIV that were men who have sex with men, you'll see that it's a it is an international issue. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that uh, the folks that you don't see at the table that I think we should probably give a little bit of credit to um, are the folks spearheading efforts in Sacramento to try to get this off the ground, and that's uh, Equality California. Um, they have agreed to partner with the working group to try to to move this forward. Um, and so, you know, as you as we as the group mobilizes, I think you'll be hearing more about their involvement and kind of their work in Sacramento um, in conjunction with, you know, all the usual suspects, if you will, the ACLU and um, lobbyists for the AIDS Foundation and Project Inform and um, AIDS Healthcare Foundation and really looking to bring everyone together on this issue. And we're going to close out the discussion with David. I just wanted to um, thank you for your presentation first and I hope I can articulate this, but I think maybe perhaps the challenge, and I'm thinking, looking at Aaron, in your response to Susan Forrest's comment about her paranoia about what legally uh, the state, the government, can impose us to do with our bodies. And you mentioned um, looking at trying to change the law if someone is um, charged with um, solicitation, where now it's a mandatory HIV test and making that, um, that the test has to be offered and but they have that option not to take that. I think the point I want to make is that I think it could be a very difficult time to do this and I think it's tied in with all of us here at the table because what you know what we've been doing the funding that most people here at the table are are fighting for it imposes this and with all the um, you know incredible fantastic advances with medications and with PEP and PrEP and the whole look with the national HIV AIDS strategy at community viral loads, we are all part of wanting to, to basically get everyone on a protocol, on a drug protocol, especially you know, sexually active gay men. And our funding is tied in with that where you know, someone tests positive and the whole, you know, it's mandated that you link them to care and that you get them on medications. Not so long ago, you know, there was a protocol where someone wasn't recommended medications until their T cell level dipped to a certain point where their health became compromised. But now it's as soon as you test positive and now it's before you test positive. So I just think there's many challenges and that we're part of this um, it, it, to me, there's a, there's a big kind of dichotomy, a big a little bit of a conflict, and I think it's going to make this work even more difficult because, you know, we're at the point where we have a real opportunity to completely stop transmissions, to bring a community viral load down to undetectable, where there's no longer AIDS, there's HIV, and so we are expecting people to participate and volunteer things with their, with their bodies, um, you know, whether yeah. or not the, the criminal aspect is involved. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, our motto of we want as many people to know their status as, as possible is totally true. And I think the the word that I would focus on is one of the last ones you said was volunteer, right? In, and I think that that's the distinction that we're looking at here is, and, and, and also sort of the history of um, the government deciding that we're going to impose something on you because um, we really just don't like who you are. Um, so what's to say that they can't then go and expand that to other people that they believe um, they would like to test as well? I mean, I think that that 
someone should always have, um, unless you're talking about cases um, of um, sex offenses um, and rape and things like that, I think that there should be a right, especially in the case um, of even suspicion of, of, of solicitation, um, that someone has a right to decline an HIV test. The government, at least in my opinion, um, does not have a right um, to decide that you have to get one and then transmit your results to the Department of Justice and to the court. I think that, that the working group that we've been working with has, has come to an agreement that that's a principle that we believe in. Um, so I think the difference is that one's voluntary and one's not. Um, and I think that that's where you get the distinction. And I understand what you're saying. I just think that in the case, in, in looking at this criminal statute, um, it just doesn't make sense. And it not only further stigmatizes HIV, but further stigmatizes sex workers as well. And I don't think we want to do either of those things. And David, if I could just respond, um, where you see conflict, I see opportunity. I actually think these uh, movements are, are not in opposition to each other. And let me explain why. So voluntary is, is the really big piece that, that Aaron's talking about. I think that's really important, right? I think the public health message in the move is to get more people to volunteer to get tested. The reason why people don't get tested is because of stigma, right? But I would argue, too, that the reason why people don't get tested could also be these criminal laws. In fact, knowing your status puts you at risk the way these laws are, are, are written. If you know you're positive, then you are opening yourself up to prosecution, where if you don't know that you're positive, you're not. So there's a direct link there between knowledge and not only is it subjecting you to increased stigma, it may also be subjecting you to increased criminalization. And so if you want to really get at a world in which folks are encouraged and are, um, are self-motivated to get tested and linked into care, then I think you have to look at a world that has less stigma and no criminalization. And so that's how I would look at the world that you, you are picturing, that I see it as an opportunity and not necessarily a conflict. And I would just add one, one thing. It's also about tax. Um, taxpayers are also at, um, affected by uh, the expense of all of these criminalizations. I think that is also a point that it was actually used in Iowa. Um, and to, so to think about um, this idea of people being criminalized because they're HIV positive, and on top of that, you know, we have to pick up the tab. Something to think about it as well. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Uh, the, the topic is certainly very relevant to the work that we do, and I hope that you will use us to help you move these laws forward. And I, and I want to invite you to come back in the future to give us an update on, on how things have changed. Uh, thank you to, uh, to the presenter and to the panel. Please join me in giving them a hand. Thank you.